Hello, my name is John Reynolds. Welcome to Extraordinary Life Stories. On this episode, I'm talking with Simon Ong. Simon is a renowned life coach, author, and motivational speaker, celebrated for his insights into personal development and peak performance. As the author of the best-selling book, Energize, Make the Most of Every Moment, Simon has inspired countless individuals to unlock their potential and live more fulfilling lives. This is of particular personal interest to me, so I'm really keen to know from Simon what physical and mental practices would be his number one default above all else. Let's find out. Simon, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, John. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Tell me, who is Simon Ong? Simon Ong is someone who has gone through a journey, a journey of transformation from somebody who was very shy and introverted as a young Chinese kid to someone now who regularly gets up on stage and tries to inspire and empower audiences wherever he goes. Definitely inspired. <laughs> Definitely inspired. And thank you for sending me the book. My pleasure. We're to speak today, Energize, which is so relevant to mm. all of us, but my yeah. life right now. Take me back to a young Simon starting out and, and the sort of early career influences and mm. decisions that you made. So my childhood was, was quite tough. Um, in the sense, I grew up in a very strict Asian household. My, my dad was very focused on results, uh, and so your worthiness in the family was very much determined by how well you did at school. So that kind of set me on the path to being a hard worker. Was you that know. academic and sport, like everything? Ac- or? Academic primarily, and I think this is a very stereotypical upbringing mm. for, for young Chinese kids. Uh, but at the same time, because I didn't get much outside exposure beyond academics, I, I, I was very shy, I was, I was very introverted, and kind of kept myself to myself. Uh, you, you often have this stereotypical image of the Chinese kid in the corner of the library with a you know, skyscraper books next to him, and that was, that was very much myself. And I actually went further into my shell when, when I was 17. Uh, because when I was 17, uh, I lost my mum to a tragic accident, and so she was the emotional glue of the family. She kind of brought everyone together. And so post that, uh, I couldn't talk to people about it. In, in fact, when I left secondary school, to go to university. In a way, I was kind of glad that I was the only one from my school that made it to the university because I could start with a clean sheet. Nobody knew my background, nobody knew who I was, and it was then me able to kind of fashion my own path forward in the world. But what I learned from that experience, as tragic as it was, was how short life is, that we only have one life, and it spurred me to take action. It spurred me to kind of put myself out there and then explore what I was capable of. But because I had this background of follow the academics, become a banker, become a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, I fell into banking after watching films like Boiler Room and and Wall Street that kind of seduced me into that career. And I started at the worst possible time, in the middle of 2007, a year before the global financial crisis. And just to make things a little interesting, the first company I was with was Lehman Brothers. Um, So that was a crazy beginning to my career in finance. Wow, there's so much there. And actually just just listening to you there, that Mm. whole strict father, and it's coming from a good place. He wants you to be successful. Mm. He wants you to pass the exam so you can get a good job. And yet at that age, I guess that wasn't necessarily what was inspiring you, but you feel you've got to do it because of of what your father said. And the school curriculum right Mm. now, in my opinion, is archaic. We're still learning how to use a Bunsen burner, but we come out of school and we haven't learned mm. anything about what you've got in your book as energized mindfulness, yeah. well-being. And um, we're not learning about financial literacy, for example. And we're all going to have rents or mortgages mm. to pay. What needs to change? You know, cycling back to that system right now, it feels like th- that's being sort of planned for people to go and get a job. Yeah. Now that entrepreneur, that person mm. that wants to follow their passion, probably isn't getting that from school. Well, what needs to change? Th- this is the issue. So you go through school and you learn English, math and science and then you graduate into the world of work, and immediately you're expected to present well, interview well, manage your finances, and build a successful career without learning all of the things you're supposed to be good at. And we don't go through school learning how to present to a class or how to manage our finances. And so I think this is where education has to change. I'm a parent of a a young four-year-old daughter, and recently I saw just how creative she is. Uh, So she went to this class, and at the end, the teacher goes to this group of girls in a circle, and she says, as a thank you for coming, I want to give each of you a colored egg shaker so you can take it home as a gift, but you're only allowed to take one. So she starts with the first girl and she works her way around the circle, and my daughter is sitting at the end. 
So she comes to my daughter and she says, Sienna, just take one egg. Sienna looks up and smiles and she takes two eggs. And the teacher stops and says, Sienna, you're only meant to take one. And she responded by saying, but I did miss. The other one is for my dad. And the teacher couldn't respond to that. The funny thing is, when I walked out of that room through the corridor out of school, my daughter looks up to me and she says, Dad, can I have my egg back now? And she got the two eggs. But what that taught me is that we are all born creative. We have creativity within us. Yet as we grow older and we enter the formal education system, we lose that. Schools can kill that creativity because it doesn't nurture the skills that we're born I with. I totally agree with It this. wants all of us to conform to certain subjects rather than saying, well, what comes naturally to you? How do we encourage that? How do we grow that? And I think that combined with some of these life skills would make education far more powerful. Totally. I love that. Your four-year-old's going to be formidable, <laughs> right? I bet you were really proud of her as well. <laughs> so proud, so proud. I was like, <laughs> here's the egg, have I it. Said, there, there's the entrepreneurial gene. <laughs> and that's a life lesson there, right? From a dad who's a yeah. successful entrepreneur and understands this and you've educated yourself mm. in that. And actually, let's, let's get yeah. to that. So you've got that pressure from your father and, and what is ultimately the sort of the culture of yeah. you know, employment. When did you ultimately become an, a, a, uh, an entrepreneur and stop? Because that's a big, that's a big decision. It's huge. There's, there's guaranteed salary. Mm. It could be the benefits that come with it, healthcare, so on. And just yeah. the very fact that you know you've got you know, some security to then leave that behind and be an entrepreneur. It's tough. Uh, I, I spent nearly 10 years in the corporate world before I quit and started my own business. But I think the skills of entrepreneurship really began developing from my second year of university uh, because I failed my second year of university, which is never easy to share with a parent, especially when it's a, you know, a parent that has high expectations of what you should achieve out of uh, your, your formal path through university. And it meant that when I was applying for jobs, I couldn't go onto the company's website and fill in a typical application form because on the first page, it asks you for your grades and I had three fails out of four exams. So I would never get past the first page. And so what it meant is the only way for me to get a job was to sign up to all of the campus presentations where the companies were coming to our university and just network myself into a job. So, so you started, learned new skills at that point? I was, you learning, had to. I was learning those skills, the entrepreneurial skills I know now from that point. Because if I didn't, I, I wouldn't have a job. And so I went to these events, signed myself up. I was the first one there, the last one to leave. And I would just go around and get curious and build relationships. So much so that so many people said to me, Simon, send us your CV, we'll forward on to HR, we'll get you the first round, the rest is up to you. And that got me so much in terms of opportunities to land job offers, to get introductions and referrals to other opportunities. Yeah, because that's personal, that's <coughs> emotional intelligence, that's yeah. sales, we're ultimately always, in anything we do, selling ourselves, right? Mm. Which is a mm. big part of, um, you know, a lot of what's in your book, if you like. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, one of the things I, I say in my book is that there are always two sales that occur. The second is selling you to others, and the first is selling you to you. And unless you can do the first well, the second will always remain a challenge. So in effect, I had to sell me to me. I had to believe that I could get that job and perform well at it in order for them to feel that as well. Because if I didn't feel I could do that, they would sense that. They, they would kind of sense that unease or uncertainty within me. Yeah, so well articulated. I mean, it's almost like parallel. If you don't love yourself, how mm. can you love anyone yeah. else? And if you hear, if we could hear mm. what some people are saying to them, themselves yeah. in their head, you, you sort of you wouldn't want to be friends with them, let alone be no. family. And this is a, this probably brings us very much to, to what you really specialise in. How can someone learn to mm. love themselves, have confidence? That's what it comes down to. The yeah. Confidence, which comes back to the, the the sales. If you can sell yourself, how mm. does how does someone that's potentially struggling? to um, have that confidence. Sure. And, and this goes back to being the entrepreneur. Mm. What advice would you give them? A couple of things come to my mind. The first is you don't need confidence. Not yet, that is. What you need first is courage. So the courage to try, the courage to take a tiny step forward into the unknown, because that builds your confidence. It's difficult to have confidence if you've got nothing to reference, if you don't have any evidence that you can do it, because otherwise you're just making it up. But if you focus on courage, what's the first tiny step I can take in order to embark on this unknown path in life? And then as you accomplish that, you might say to yourself, that wasn't so bad actually, let's try another step. 
and that's how you build your confidence. So courage comes first, confidence comes after. And as you build your confidence, you have even greater courage to take on bigger and bolder steps. The second is the mindset piece. A lot of us, the reason why we don't think we can do something is because we're basing uh, our present day choices on past influences. So that's all we know. Because that's all we know. So you might say something to yourself like, I've never been good at this, or this has never worked out for me. Now what's happening is that if you're basing present choices, decisions and actions on past influences, you can never change your path. Instead, you want to base present decisions on your future self. So imagine yourself 10 years from now, living the life you want, enjoying the sort of lifestyle you desire. Now what would that version of you say to the version of you today? And then work the steps back to that. Absolutely, reverse engineer, begin with the yeah. end in mind. And it's something that, I, I don't know if you saw the 2014 uh, acceptance speech at the Oscars from Matthew McConaughey. I have seen uh, it. For his performance in the film uh, Dallas Buyers Club. And the third thing, he shared three things, and the third thing he said is we need someone to chase in life. And he said that the person he chases in life is him 10 years from now. But it's not in 10 years time he's there, it's that person 10 years ahead will always be 10 years away. And that's because we need someone to chase, but when it's you 10 years ahead, it always gives you a pull forward. And there's a big difference between pull and push. If you have to push yourself forward, which is motivation, that never lasts. You know, just think about how many of us make New Year's resolutions. I was that, gonna ask yeah, you that this. requires yeah. a push. So you feel like internally, I have to do this. I have to go to the gym, I have to sign up to this, I have to eat healthier. Now, if you're always feeling like you're pushing yourself forward, it's never gonna last because it requires willpower. But if you create an energetic pull, more of a magnetism behind the vision, you wake up effortlessly. You just find the energy to do something. You plow through because there's something pulling you forward, that vision, that future self. It's like manifesting, right? Yeah, you can see what you're saying is, see it and then work out how you're gonna get there, reverse engineer to put the steps in, mm. in place. Um, in context of the, the New Year's resolutions, obviously yeah. we're sitting here in August, tell me, <laughs> how many people will be so annoyed with themselves, frustrated mm. that they haven't, so hearing this now is inspiring, it's yeah. educational, mm. it's real experience. How did you do it? So you, you've, you've gone, that you're sort of still employed yeah. and um, you've, you've become disillusioned with the corporate world but that shift to then actually not only stop, mm. but that interest that you have in self-development yeah. and how you kind of bottle that all up to then be someone that helps so many other people. Mm. How did, where did that come about? So I remember when I was sitting uh, in my last job in employment before I quit, I would hear people banter on a Friday afternoon around me saying, when I win the lottery, when I make enough money, when I get the promotion, then I'll start doing this in my life. And I didn't want to be those people, you know, 10 years away. I didn't want to be sitting in the same job saying, one day, one day, one day. And so what I did is I said, well, what's the easiest way for me to get out of what I didn't find fulfilling and to do something that would bring more joy into my life? Because what I observed is that many of us are exhausted, not because we are physically doing too much, but because one, we are doing too little of the things that bring us joy, and second, we're running someone else's race. But one insight I got from speaking to an entrepreneur who was a few years ahead of me, he said, Simon, it's not always about jumping off the cliff and putting your parachute together as you go down. That's what is glamorized in stories of entrepreneurship. The best way to create the transition is to de-risk things and to make that transition as easy as possible. So what I did is I changed my relationship with my job and I started to build this on the side, like a side hustle. Uh, so what I mean by- It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, it wasn't a, a and then- sharp cut off no. and straight into business. So how I changed the relationship with my job is I started to change my identity first. So I didn't see myself as an employee trying to be, so an employee trying to become an entrepreneur. I saw myself as an entrepreneur already mentally. This is where the future self part comes in. And then I said to myself, well, if I'm an entrepreneur now, what does that mean my relationship is with my job? Well, suddenly I saw my employer as kind of like my investor. My employer was giving me capital, which was my monthly paycheck. Now I'm the entrepreneur, how am I gonna use that? Am I gonna waste it on partying and, and, and drinks? Or am I gonna funnel that into business related activities? Am I gonna invest that in memberships or communities? Am I gonna invest that into my education, into courses, into getting mentorship? And so I treated 
the monthly paycheck I had as capital for my business. Uh, and, it, and it was funny because as I think back now, I felt like Superman but without the superpowers. So I was going into the office with a white shirt, tie and suit, and in my black bag I had my uh, black t-shirt and jeans. Uh, so I would at different points of the day go to the toilet cubicle, change out of my suit into my t-shirt and jeans and go out to network to meet prospective clients. And I was building and building on the side until it got to this point where I had to make a decision. It was either I continue with my day job and limit myself to free paying clients, or I quit the day job and see just how far I can take this. How far away were you from with the three paying clients to where that would replace the salary? So I, so I got to a point where I was at three paying clients and I said to myself, if I got a fourth, my job would suffer, but so would my coaching because I could only do this in the evenings and weekends. So you reached the tipping point. So I'd reached this tipping point. And it took, a, it took a couple of months, I'm not gonna lie, there's a lot of back and forth in my head. Um, a lot of back and forth as to whether I should do this or not because we never know ahead of time. Uh, but one question I asked myself is, when I get to the end of my life, would I regret not taking this opportunity? And of course the answer was yes. And so I didn't decide this on logic, uh, I decided this on emotion and the energy, and I said, let's do it. And I never looked back since. No. Now, at that point, that, mm. that, that, was that a lonely time for you? Or did you, those two months where you were like, because oh, you've got some proof of concept, right? Yeah. And you're now like, mm. this could be great. And of course, it's gone on to be brilliant. Mm. But um, did you have any mentors? Did you have anyone around yeah. you to, to uh, support you with, um, with sort of confidence? Mm. Like, you know, you should do it Definitely. and so on. Or were Definitely. you quite alone with that? One of the first things I changed, uh, which I always encourage people to do if they're looking to begin on a new path, especially when you're going from one career to another, is to design an environment around you that makes it impossible not to succeed. Because you're gonna face setbacks and failures and challenges, no doubt, it's an inevitable part of the journey. But you can bounce back faster if you have the right support uh, and environment around you. So I had so mentors. Fail fast. Indeed, mentors, coaches. Uh, I had lots of good books around me, uh, things I was reading, things I was watching, podcasts I was listening to. And it also gave me awareness uh, about the impact of failure. So I think the big mistake we have about failure is failure can mean two things. So you could describe an event as a failure, so this didn't work out the way we expected, or failure could also be an identity statement. I am a failure. And this is the part where we have to be careful about. We, we know in the startup world there is fail fast, fail often, and that's referring the event. Let's try things, let's break things up, let's disrupt things, and then we can learn from it. But when you're in the moment, and things don't go your way, we can very easily mistake the event for the identity. So when it doesn't work out, internally you might go home and say to yourself, I'm a complete failure. And I think that's where it gets tough. So for me, I moved away from seeing things as failure and just saw things as experiments. And I said to myself, how many experiments can I do this week? How many experiments can I do this month? And that's what allowed me to be bold in the way I did things. Uh, that's how I learned marketing. You, you know, how could I create different ways of thinking so I could go from where I was to where I wanted to be faster than ever before. Yeah, I love that. And I've learned this from your book <laughs> and from a bit of a crash course over the last two or three years of my mm. life where I've been consuming authentic yeah. uh, self-development and, and stuff that makes sense when mm. you hear that back because I definitely, as a younger version of me, yeah. was afraid of failing. Mm. And if I did anything that I either thought would fail or actually didn't look like it was going to work, mm. I'd pull back. Yeah. And yeah, I'm tenacious. I'm so mm. it's, just, it's a mindset, isn't it? It's a... To, to relate it to, is it James Dyson that yeah. kind of came up with like 10,000 kind of attempts mm. until he gets the, yeah. the thing? And then it's, it's, it's a constant Edison experimentation, so yeah. Exactly. It's a constant experimentation. And, and also when we think of, I mean, we, you mentioned Dyson and Thomas Edison. One of the things we, we don't acknowledge as much when we look at these individuals is we look at the outcomes, we look at what they've achieved and accomplished. But what we forget is that it wasn't all done with them sitting in their lab or sitting in front of their desk 24-7. A lot of their breakthroughs came from when they disconnected, when they found space to just be. So Thomas Edison's a great example. He spent, uh, at the peak of his career, an hour every day fishing. But he never caught a single fish. You know why? Because he never used bait. Oh, so so no the principle of just, just calm being, and... So no one, not even the fish, I've would disturb him. And he would have all of these insights come to him. And he would rush back to his office, sketch all these ideas down. Now, it's not to say they would all work, but it's just a free flow, what came into his mind. So what I've noticed is that if you look around society, we're collecting dots every day, where basically you read something, you had a great conversation, but how often are we giving ourselves space to connect those dots, to make sense of all of the inputs that we're getting? 
Yeah, and I've, actually that's always come naturally to me. Not not, mm. not always um, able to fit it into what I'd call a routine yeah. because I have no routine, mm. but I'm, I'm always conscious that I need yeah. these gaps, whatever that might be. And I'm really interested mm. to ask you, as someone that's got so much knowledge yeah. in, in what works to keep both physically and mentally mm. fit, Flip that back to Edison sitting yeah. deliberately knowing he's not going to catch a fish, but in that environment <laughs> works for him. What works for you? Because you mm. have probably experimented and um, you know tried so many different things. Yeah. What is it that works for you both to keep mentally fit and to keep physically because you clearly keep fit? Yeah, I think the first is knowing what your priorities are. You know, we, we think we do, but we don't. If you ask somebody what is on your priority list, often they'll roll out a long to-do list. And the fact is you'll never finish it. There's always going to be something more to add. You can't visualise that either, can you? If you've just it's, got a long list, you're not, you're not actually identifying something that... It's, it's, that it's difficult. So, yeah. so one of the questions I often ask people I coach is if you only had one hour this week to work on your business, what would you do? You've only got one hour this week. Um, and then I build that up. I say, now if you had four hours, if you had eight hours, if you had 12 hours, because what happens is it forces the mind to prioritise. And for me, it happened through parenthood. You know, the question I've often got asked is, do I find myself more or less productive now I'm a parent? And I actually say more, more productive. Because before I was a parent, I could easily procrastinate. You know, I could say, okay, I'm going to think about it tonight. Give me the weekend to think about it. But once you're a parent, you've got a limited window to get your work done before you have to pick them up from school, spend time with them. And of course, you want to spend the weekends with them and be present and give them your energy. And so with this limited time frame, it forces me to prioritise. If I've only got four hours to get work done today, totally. what is the most important thing to dedicate my energy to? So you've got one hour tomorrow, and you know you've got that one hour to, to put time into physical exercise. Mm. What will you do? For me, it's gym. Uh, Weights? I, weight, I do weight training, cardio, active rest, swimming. I do a mixture. I, I like to vary it because otherwise you get bored. You, you, you need to make the process fun. Uh, the process isn't fun. Um, then and vary as well. Do you vary? Vary because I get guilty sometimes of repeating the same thing, and then I've yeah. got sterile with that. And so it's like actually you know, repeat. So yeah, so I mix it up. So every other day is weight training in between cardio, active rest, swimming, cycling, uh, and then if I want to toss it up, I'll, I'll go to a class where the teacher's running the workshop, and I have no idea what's going to come next. So it so it's able to cool. shock yeah. the body. Uh, but the key thing is to keep it fun. I, I, I see people who are going through a process to get to where they want to be. And the moment it becomes a chore is the moment you start to give up or you start to feel like it's not working out and, 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 and it affects your energy. Yeah. But if you find a process that can be fun on, along the way, find a way to turn it to a bit of a game, then you're gonna have the energy to sit through, absolutely. Yeah. You know, Denzel Washington said, without commitment, you never begin. But more importantly, without consistency, you will never finish. Which is another reason why having uh, a personal trainer can mm. be a good thing because you're accountable. Yeah. And actually, that's really relevant to, to asking you the same question in terms of an hour or half an hour, mm. whatever you give the mm. mental fitness. Yeah. One, what do you do? There's meditation, there's sure. breath work and so on. But yeah. also, your thoughts um, on therapy. Because mm. there's two guys talking to each other yeah. 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Mm. You'd never um, admit that you had... You were having therapy because yeah. of your relationship or because mm. of your own mental health, but you probably quite happily admit you had a personal trainer or you'd yeah. hurt yourself playing football mm. yesterday mm. physically, but you're not going to admit that you're hurting yeah. or in, in suffering. It feels like that's changing, which um, is only going to be a good mm. thing. But what would you do with that half an hour, hour of uh, mental fitness? Mm. And what are your thoughts on seeking help and therapy? So I would do two things related to what you just said. Number one is journal. Um, sounds simple, but so few of us do it. Uh, journal is like therapy for free. So literally pen and paper and pen a little and private book or yeah, somewhere where you book. can no, just have nothing, a safe place. Nothing digital. No. Old, old school, pen on paper, because it forces you to be present. You have to be with your thoughts and then you download what is on your mind onto paper. Now when you first start, you, you might require a few prompts to kind of get you thinking, but after a while you'll find your own way to journal best. Uh, one of my friends, Diana Chow, she said it best. She said, writing is humanity distilled into ink. And so what happens through the process of writing is you get to know yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, your ambitions, your, your challenges, your obstacles. And beginning to know yourself is where wisdom starts. So that's the first activity. The second is to find people that you can be vulnerable with. Uh, you, you know, I've said that vulnerability is the path to connection. 
That's how we connect at a deep level. I did a training with some leaders a few weeks back actually, and in one of these icebreak activities, instead of people standing up and saying, here's my name, this is what I do, which I find a bit boring, doesn't really tell you much about someone, what they had was a question uh, on their seat. So each person had a different question. And the questions were there to allow us to get to know them beyond the title. So to give an example, one question somebody had was, what failure do you cherish the most and why? Cherish. Mm. You never would have put failure and cherish Indeed. in one sentence. And, and so by asking a question that probably we haven't got asked before, it forces us to really reflect. And when we answer, the people that listen get to know us at a deeper level. And that tells you far more than just saying, hey, I'm Simon, I'm a coach. It doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, and so using these sort of questions allow us to speak into them, but also welcomes people into our world. I think it's brilliant. And actually, what I love about that is there are definitely, particularly in business, people mm. that are deemed to be successful or are already on a successful trajectory, mm. but ego could stop uh, the vulnerability, to use yeah. your word, which is mm. you know, very much um, summing that up. What would you say to someone that's either in that position where, mm. you know, why do I need Simon? Sure. Why do I need help? I'm, I'm doing well, I'm successful. Mm. Um, and also someone that, dare I say, forget the ego and the, the overconfidence side of things, but it's just sort of saying, I don't really know if I need it or yeah. I'm not sure where to start. Mm. Mm. Because you could say that just what you said then about the fact that that, um, that question is a great yeah. opener to get mm. curious. But if yeah. someone needs more encouragement and needs to form a habit sure. that starts asking more questions, that opens up the vulnerability, mm. what can they do to start that? So the first thing to understand, especially when egos are play, uh, is you don't need this. The question is whether you want it. There's a big difference. If you want to think different, if you want to push your comfort zone, if you want to really fulfill your potential and disrupt yourself and to be able to adapt to whatever the world throws away, then yes, you should try this. You should uh, seek some coaching and mentoring. But if you think you know it all, if you think you don't need any other help to help you move forward in your path, I'm not here to convince you otherwise. So the real question is whether somebody wants it. And that's because you can't change somebody that does not want to be changed. Uh, and so for me, you have ego on one side and you have humility on the other side. The greatest skill we can develop is the ability to adapt, to adapt to whatever the world throws our way. And the world is changing at a rapid pace. And your ability to adapt is driven by your desire to learn and be curious. And you can't learn and be curious if you're coming from a place of ego. Because ego says, I know it all. Ego says, why do I need to learn from you? Whereas humility says, there's always something I can learn. Yeah. I can learn something from him or her. And so when you come from a place of humility, you access this experience called pronoia, uh, which basically means the opposite of paranoia. So paranoia is this feeling that the world is out to get me. Living in Somebody is, is trying to sabotage my, my, my progress. But pronoia is this belief that the universe is conspiring in my favor. Life is working for me, not against me. So what that means is when something doesn't work out, your brain will say, well, what can we learn from this? How can we come back stronger? And that's coming from a place of humility. That's coming from pronoia. Whereas ego would say, why not me? So it's a very different place to operate. Yeah, you articulate that really well. <laughs> and actually, sitting here now, you're, you're a best-selling author, mm. successful businessman, <clears throat> surrounded by a, a network and mm. context that are also very successful. Mm. Sitting here now, how do you define success? Success for me is simply about being better than who you were yesterday. It's as simple as that. Because the moment you think success is somewhere there, a destination, then what next? We get complacent. We, we forget how we got somewhere. Ego takes over. I mean, you just have to look at Hollywood, the music industry, celebrity culture. A lot of people, when they get success thrown at them so quickly, they don't know how to handle it. They think they've arrived, and very quickly after, many go bankrupt. They don't know how to handle it. So for me, success is simply, are you better than who you were yesterday? Which you, is also to seek to be better. Yeah, to which seek is, which is part of the drive every and the single purpose, day. Right? Because what happens is if you focus on that journey, putting the outcomes and rewards to one side, they will come in their own time. Uh, it, 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 it's a long game. You, you know, for me, even when I get to, a, to an old age, I will still be seeking to be better than who I was yesterday. Because if you're constantly doing that, what that means is life becomes such an enjoyable roller coaster. 
Yeah, and actually the shiny things, the watches, mm. the cars that so many people aspire to have, it's a shallow victory if you achieve that and that's what you set your yeah. heart on. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I love that. I've never heard anyone say that actually, oh, mm. like the, the, the next, next day improve because, because you're never going to... Yeah, think of that feeling. It's like, uh, and, and, and you can't describe it. You, you know, if you're better than who you were yesterday, what that creates is momentum. And internally, your voice says, oh, we're going somewhere. We're going places. Now, it's hard to quantify that feeling, but that feeling can drive you forward. That feeling makes you live in, uh, in, in a bolder way. And, and for me, that's what success is. And especially if you're living true to yourself. If you are Authentic. doing something true to yourself and you're better than who you were yesterday on a consistent basis, you, you're, you're enjoying success. Yeah, and I can feel that rippling from you. You're, you're <laughs> fueled by purpose mm. and passion. Yeah. You've, you've been able to see the traction of, of you building mm. that, that habit yeah. forming that's working for you in all parts of your life. Sitting here now with the maturity, the perspective, mm. the experiences you've got, but actually going back to that young Simon mm. growing up that, that, of course, didn't have any of that. Yeah. What advice would you give to mm. a young Simon? And I'm talking about that sort of late teens, that yeah. sort of aspirational, career-driven individual. Mm. What advice would you give to them? I'll share one advice and then I'm going to go back to passion because I think there's something we mistake when we talk about passion. So the one bit of advice I would give to the young Simon is make sure to follow your heart more than the opinions of others because your heart may not always lead you to where you want to be, but it will always lead you to where you need to be. Because when we are young, we fall into this trap where we're seeking validation from other people, our parents, our social circles, uh, and the people we want to hang around with. But they're not always the wisest guides for us. The wisest guide will always be your heart. And there's a reason for that. I mean, there's, a, there's a saying that goes, the longest journey you make are the inches from your head to your heart. And it's because we try and suppress what our heart is telling us. So take the time, listen to your heart, have the courage to take steps forward, and do not be attached to the outcome. You know, because when you get attached to the outcome, it means you cannot live in the present. Yes, have a destination, have something to think about, something to work towards, but don't be attached to it. This is the paradox here. You've got to have context of what's meaningful in your life and then just live in that present moment. Focus on today. And think about it this way, one step every day, a year from now that is 365 steps forward. Just imagine who and where you could be. And then the second thing is on passion. You know, you, you touched on passion just now. The mistake we fall into when we think about passion is follow my passion means to me, follow my interests. What am I interested in? But that's not really what passion is about. If you look at the history of the word passion, passion actually means what are you willing to sacrifice or struggle for uh, in order to get somewhere. So really the question should be what, not what are you passionate about, but what are you willing to struggle for? Which because, is hard work, right? Which is hard work because anything meaningful in life requires some struggle. It's gonna be hard. The question is, are you okay with that? Yeah. Are you prepared mentally for that? If you are, that's what passion is all about. It's brilliant. And actually, you know, the things that I have learnt that I appreciate the most, mm. have benefited from the most, yeah. are the things that have been tough or have come mm. out of a yeah. tough situation. At the mm. time, I may not have been enjoying it <laughs> um, or may not have realised how it was mm. good for me. And of course, some, of, some people will, will, will have the same experience from the death of someone close yeah. to them or something. Mm. But actually, the reality is that if you frame it right, yeah. And that, that's fueled a passion that has made you more resilient. It's, mm. um, it's only a good thing. And that's a superpower we, we don't appreciate, is that because we live in the feeling of our thinking moment to moment to moment, we have the power to choose one thought over another. When you choose one thought over another, it changes the action you take. It changes your reality and it changes your path forwards. You, you know, when an event or experience happens, the event or experience does not have an emotion. It just is. Uh, but we as humans, we need to derive an interpretation from it. It's why the same event could be good for some and bad for others. But whatever meaning you derive from it, and you get to choose what the meaning is, that influences the reality you live in. Yeah, it's brilliant. You are so interesting to talk to. <laughs> um, annoyingly, we have run out of time. But you are, you know, you've got so much knowledge and mm. wisdom. And uh, I've learned, even though I've read your book yeah. and I had conversations before mm. this, I've learned so much from talking to you. I mean, everyone watching and listening will... Be the same. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, John. Cheers. Sorry.